I'm going to have a tiny portion of the scripture on the screen, but better off if you have your Bible and you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to start off reading the whole chapter. But I'm leaving this up so that it just burns in our retina, travels down to our heart, and we feed on this, not just today, these words, but something we'll carry with us from this point on. First Thessalonians chapter 1, whole chapter. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God, our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from wrath, from the wrath to come. This letter, I believe, I believe this is the first epistle, the first letter that Paul wrote. I'm not 100% sure on that. But Paul wrote this to a baby church. He wrote this to a fledgling flock of believers. It was in this place where the Jews had stirred up anger and they, they spread lies and they, they stirred up the crowd to turn against Paul and, and the apostles and the work of the Lord there. And they tried to stop the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this place, written with idol worship and all kinds of wicked religions and teachings, in this place... The word of the Lord took root. And Paul writes to this church. And you, if you read through this and the second letter, you just see his heart just overflowing with love, with hope, and, and seeing the great victory that God is working in this church. You see Paul just rejoicing, even as he's challenging them to press on, to keep going forward. It's such a beautiful letter, and, and especially this opening, and looking at where we're at right now as a church, this flock right here. I'm looking at where we are, where God has brought us from, what he's brought us through, what he's brought us to, and this is not the end. What is it that made this church so noteworthy, not only that Paul would take notice of them, not only that Paul would write about them, but that the Holy Spirit recorded the details, the victories, the testimony of this fledgling church to be recorded for all history. What is it? There's... We're going to spend most of our time in verse 3, but look at verse 2. Look, look at this portrait as we look through this, verse 2 and 3. There's a portrait of what the true church looks like. 
I want to talk about verse 2 for a second here. If, if we as a church family are going to advance the kingdom of God here in Bandon, and not just in Bandon, but far beyond the borders of this town, we got to have these divine qualities we read right here. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Number one, the giving of thanks to God for one another. Do you do that in this body? Do you give thanks to God for everyone here? Think about that. Paul says, we thank the Lord for every one of you, speaking to the church. What an incredible blessing when we come before God with thanksgiving. It's easy to come to God with panic, with anxiety, with petitions, with stress, with, God, I need you right now, where are you? But to come before him, first of all, with thanksgiving. In fact, did we enter in his courts today, his gates, with thanksgiving in his courts with praise? Do we lead with thanksgiving? Paul says, I give thanks to God for all of you. If we recognize the glory of the body of Christ and that we need to be actively recognizing how awesome it is that we are together. And with that realization, thanking, talking to God, thanking God. Thank you that they're here today. Thank you that they're here today. Thank you that I'm here to be with them today. Thank you, God, for everybody in this place. What an awesome challenge to a church here in Bandon, to any church. Are you thankful to God for one another? Second thing, giving thanks to God always for one another. That's taking it to another level. We can say, oh, I'm thankful for this person, this person. It's great to see so many people in, in here today. There's more today than, than last time. We're growing. That's great. It's grateful. I mean, it's great to say, thank you, God, that these people are here. But Paul says, I thank God always for every one of you. Always? Even when maybe we don't agree with each other? Even maybe when I don't feel like I can be grateful because I have so much going on in my heart? I don't feel like I have anything to give someone else right now this morning in this place. I'm just barely here. I just need to run to the Father. Do you give thanks to God always for one another? What a quality of the body of Christ. And then making mention of one another in our prayers. Let me read the verse again. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. I love how he worded that. Do you make mention of everyone in this room to God in your prayers? That's a, that's a neat way. Lord, I want to mention. I want to bring up so and so. Thank you for them. Lord, work in their heart today. Intercede. Help me to intercede, Lord, right now. I don't even know what to pray, but teach me how to pray for this one. Thank you that we get to serve the Lord together. What can I do to be a blessing to them? Making mention of one another always to God. That's incredible. What a, what a challenge that I want to lay down for every one of us, starting with me. I want to commit to pray for every one of you, not just pray for you, but thank God for you, from my heart. And I do. I do, but I want to do it always. I want to be faithful. Then we get to verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Here are three core ingredients of the true Christian church, of any faithful Christ-centered church, you're going to find this. Faith, hope, and love. Sound familiar? Faith, hope, and love. Those words should be familiar. Another one of Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. These are central core things, not just of the life 
of a fo individual follower of Christ, but in particular in the body of Christ. Faith, hope, love. But you notice in this text that Paul lists these same core ingredients, but in a different order. He brings faith, and then he goes to love, and then hope. And if I remember to, towards the end, I hope to, to speak to why I think that is. Let's look at the first one. He speaks of faith, but with each of these words, remember, we're talking about what does the true church look like. With each of these words, he gives a qualifier. He adds another word to them. And the first phrase that we see regarding faith, he says, your work of faith. Let's take, let's take those words together. Your work of faith. Faith is work. Faith takes work. Faith is work. This word work that Paul uses signifies a deed, an action, an active accomplishing something. So it's like Paul saying, your active deeds of faith, your active working of faith. I thank God always for you, making mention of you in my prayers because of your active work of faith. Your faith is working, church. And I thank God for it. We know from Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible, not hard, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If a church is not operating, operating by true faith, the working of faith through the body of Christ, it's impossible for that church to please God. Paul says, you guys, your faith is at work and is reaping eternal rewards both for you and all around you. The whole region is talking about you. Guess what? The whole world is going to be talking about you. The working of faith. Faith is work, but work is not faith. Huge difference. We can't say that faith is work, but you can't say that all work is faith. That's what the devil wants us to believe. The devil wants us to believe you got to work harder to prove your faith, that faith is really working and, and getting dirty and gritty. And if you're not working hard enough, you don't have enough faith. And you know, Satan will always throw a little truth in with his wicked lies. Yes, works is inseparably linked to true faith in Jesus. But work is not faith. Paul says in, in the letter to the Ephesians, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You're not saved by your works. We're saved by grace through faith. We have to have faith in order to please God. We have to have faith in order to come to him and, and use the faith, the measure of faith that God supplies to each one of us. We take that gift and we offer it to God willingly. And we are saved by his grace through faith, but not of works. But then in the very next verse, Paul says this. For we are his workmanship, Created in Christ for good works. You're not saved by them, but you're created for good works. You see, faith is work. And Paul says, I praise the Lord for your work of faith. None of this stupid San Diego Padres faith. I'm so glad we don't do it anymore. Well, sometimes every now and then I see a sign up in the stadium. Someone still holds up the 1990 slogan, keep the faith. Oh, I hate that. No, there's no faith in the Padres. Don't keep it. They'll disappoint you. Joe tried to encourage me last night. Hey, great to see the Padres doing well. Joe, you're just making it worse when, I, when the crash happens for me. But I appreciate your support. Faith isn't just this, oh, I have faith, I believe, I believe. Faith will prove itself, James says. When works comes, when there's an active working of our faith. Let me read what James says here. 
thought I had it right here. Missed it. Oh, come on, Jim, where is it? Dawn, you can't leave. Where is it in James? Faith. Ah, chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm, filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? He goes on and on. He talks about the working faith Working together, what does he say? Verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with his work? Speaking of Abraham, faith and work are inseparable. And Paul says, you demonstrate, church, you demonstrate your work of faith and is giving glory to God. Can that be said here? Is there a, a working of faith in this place? I believe there is. I know there is, but do we recognize it and do we give thanks to God for one another and do we seek to advance that? The next thing, your labor of love. Now, at first glance, it kind of looks like he's just, Paul might be trying to be poetic, using another, another way of saying the same thing, your work of faith, your labor of love. Doesn't it sound like Paul, just, he could just say, I praise God for your work of faith and love. Your work and labor, because work and labor are the same thing, aren't they? Your work of faith, your labor of love. Maybe he's just being poetic, maybe he's just rewording it. You know, when I was writing essays in college and looking at the word count, I need another 50 words. How many phrases can I repeat? and do triplets and stretch out the word count. Is that what he's doing? Is he being redundant? I don't think so. He, this is through the Holy Spirit. There's a specific pairing of these words. Work goes with faith. But this word labor is not just an action. It's not just a deed, a working This word labor has a deeper connotation. It means the manner in which you labor in love. I can do a work. I can do my work, punch in the time clock, and get my work done just enough so that I don't get fired and come back the next day and my boss will let me clock in again. But labor is a quality of work. And Paul links that. He... He could have said labor with faith, but he says faith involves working, action, getting down and working hard. It's the work is coming out of faith. But then he says, but not just that. You guys are laboring in love. There's suffering involved in labor. There's time that elapses when you labor. You've got to endure. Love is an enduring quality that only comes from the Father. God is love. And we have no love unless we take the love of God that he's just lavished on us and reflect that through others. Listen to that chapter. I referenced it earlier. 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, what a work, what a work of faith to even go so far as to give your body and actively say, I will give myself for this work of God. Even if I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me zippo, nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Love does, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love suffers. Love labors. And Paul ends that section with love never fails. Paul says, you, church, in the midst of all that turmoil, in the midst of the persecution that you are surrounded by, you are working your faith out, but you're doing it with a labor of love. You love to do the work that God has called you to. Way to go, church. I thank God always for you, for your labor of love. Is that quality here? Or are we just going through the motions of cranking out the works that we know the faith requires? Oh, let our love be seen, be experienced through our laboring for souls in Jesus' name. The third one, the third quality here, work of faith, labor of love. The last one is your patience of hope. When I first saw that, like, that's kind of a weird pairing of words, patient of hope. And then I, as I poured into it, that's not weird at all. It, it makes sense. Your patience of hope in the Lord Jesus. We've seen how Paul ascended from work of faith. He, he started with the working of faith. And he says that working is infused with the labor of love. But now he takes it to the conclusion, and he says, and that labor of love through the working of faith is bringing about patience of hope. There's a hope that is permeating through you. And that hope is being talked about all around. Lives are being changed because of your patience of hope. You guys aren't just working, and you're not just laboring. It's a labor of love because you love God first and your neighbor as yourself. You're doing it with a spirit of hope through patience. You're enduring. That means you're able to keep doing this. If, if the church has said we have this work of faith to do, and we've got to labor because we love souls, and they, they meet that work, they did it, and they say, whew, that was tough. And then they're, they're done working, done laboring, no, he says, you guys are continu you're a continual fountain flowing of hope. There's a patience of hope that is only the work of Christ in you. Hope is, is an incredible thing. Hope is the key factor in perseverance. If we have a bad case of the stomach flu and we're facing a long night of, of throwing up or whatever, I don't want to go into detail, sorry. The stomach flu, you know what happens. We can have hope, right, that we're going to get through this because there's a pretty good chance it may just be a 24-hour thing. It could be food poisoning. But even if it's something worse, I've been sick like this before. I'm sure I can get through it. This is a simple, stupid example, but hope, if we have hope, we can endure through something. And perseverance is a key factor, endurance, patience with hope. We have the greatest reason to hope of all. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for us. We can be patient, can't we, church? We can, we can endure, we can persevere through anything. Paul says you're doing it, and you're doing it with such fervor that everybody's talking about it. In fact, he says we don't need to say anything else. But Paul does anyways, just like a preacher. I was going to give another example. I'm going to save that.
Paul says, we were saved in this hope in Romans. We were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Perseverance. Also in Hebrews 10, verse 35 and 36. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. That hope is coming in the church of the living God, the true church, not just that meets in Bandon, but the church, every soul who puts faith in Christ, the true church has a patience of hope, and they continue through any trial, any struggle, any sadness, whatever it is. Our work of faith is infused with the love of Jesus Christ, who labored for us, who suffered and died for us. Therefore, we have all the hope in the world that we're going to be patient to the end. The three ingredients every church needs, faith, love, and hope, Paired with those other three words, that is our marching orders. But you know what? As I looked at this text, the Lord gave me this text. It just, it just thrilled me just to see how beautifully and easily Paul laid it out, what the church is supposed to look like. But the Lord hit me with something else. Maybe, maybe you've seen it too. Let me read our main text again. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father, God and Father. You know what that reminded me of? That reminded me of Don and Sheila and Bob. I see these qualities. I, I resonate with these truths that are spoken to me as a pastor shepherding a flock of believers. And I read these and I say, I know what that looks like. I know what the work of faith looks like in you guys. I know what it looks like to labor with love. I've seen you guys labor. I've seen you intercede for everyone here. And it's because of your patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ that those lessons were cemented in my heart and in the testimony of this church. You know, 26 years ago, God called Don and Sheila to pastor this church. We didn't come up until about three years later, three years after that. But God called them specifically to pastor this church. And when they came, this church was full of good people. But there was not a passion for the Lord as it ought to be. There was something greatly lacking. And there was some hard, hard things in ministry that had to, have, had to take place in Don and Sheila because of the work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of hope. You guys love this church to Jesus, to a passion for Christ. And that that set in motion something that we are experiencing today. And it was just a few years after that that God punished us more with Bob. <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. Can you imagine this family without any of these people? When Bob came, it was like, wow, this is weird. Who's this guy? And suddenly... It's like, it feels like he's been here all along. Like, 
is this, has he been here for years? Because when Bob came here, he poured into everyone immediately. And he was an encourager from the very beginning. You know, I, I look at this, this passage, not just this. If you look at the rest of the chapter, there's other things. Look, I want to just go through chapter 1 and pray to God. Make mention to God with thanksgiving about these three. Praying through the whole chapter. You're going to see there's way more qualities than just these three I'm bringing out that they exude. But I will say this as I'm wrapping this up. That everybody in this room right now, whether you know it or not, you have been blessed by the Lord because of these three. I could say that if you were brand new to this morning. Brand new here. Someone just walked in for the first time. You know what? You've been blessed by the Lord because of the work of faith, labor, of love, and the patience of hope of these three. Because they kept the fire burning here. And they poured into all of us. I looked out. I see Cheyenne here. Cheyenne, I'm going to pick on not Actually, I'm not going to pick on you. I'm going to pick on Jared. I've only said this to a, a few people over the years. I don't even know if I said this to you. But I'm going to say it to the world now. To YouTube. There's only be, been two people in all my years of youth ministry that I felt like the Lord was telling me, you got to tell them they can't come anymore because they're disrupting the group. They're, they're making it so that you can't even share the gospel in that setting. It's that disruptive. And eventually there was one I actually had to say that to, and that killed me. But there was one more that I literally came within minutes before youth group of doing. And it was Jared. Jared was a thorn in my flesh. I loved him. But any time I started to do the lesson, he would talk. He would poke the person next to him. He'd laugh and get other people laughing. <laughs> and and I, I, I got to tell him, I have to tell him, you cannot come here anymore because I got to meet the needs of everyone here. But something happened. The Lord stopped me. And I think it was the very next week he gave his heart to the Lord right after youth group. You know what? It was Dawn and Sheila and Bob who had a tremendous part in him coming to the Lord. Because they prayed for Jared. And they prayed for me. And they prayed for everyone in that youth group. They still do. And if it wasn't for their work of faith, labor, of love, and patience of hope, where would Jared be? I hope Jared is walking with the Lord right now. I haven't talked with him in a long time. I hope, I hope you are. I hope every one of you are. But I will tell you this. Every one of us have received blessing because of these three. May we strive to be, have, have that same testimony. That is what the church is. This is our marching orders from here on out. Are you in? We've got a lot of changes, church, coming at us. Like right now. Praise the Lord. God never changes. So he'll deal with it. But let's be faithful. And let this be our motto, our, our champion cause, whatever you want to call it, going forward. These qualities, faith, love, and hope. Love infuses faith and hope, but there's hope in the working. There's working in the love, working in hope. They are all together. The, the gospel is the incarnate gospel. God made flesh. And the gospel of Jesus Christ says, I will work in you to will and to do for my good pleasure. It is Christ in us that will do this. Praise the Lord. We know what that looks like. Thank you, guys. And this is something that has happened a lot of late. We've been ending our service with prayer, but we're going to do it again. I'm going to ask that you three come up, and we're just going to gather around 
these three as a church, lay hands on them, and we're going to thank God for them. Can you join me down here?